G'day folks and welcome back to Great Chesterford Model Railway and the uh, part of the uh, coupling tutorial where we show you how to build them and the parts required and uh, some of the jigs that uh, are required as well to make them successfully. So we'll have a look at the parts now. Now the first thing that you need are neodymium magnets. Um, these are 3mm by 1.5mm neodymium, neodymium magnets and they come from a reputable uh, supplier in Australia and uh, this is the thing that I would suggest to you I mean I have purchased uh, magnets in the past uh, on that well-known auction site online um, and the magnets have come from a country in the Far East and some remote province in that uh, particular country and uh, they've certainly been delivered on time but I felt that they weren't up to the specification that they claimed that they would be. Whereas magnets bought from a uh, retailer here who specialises in magnets only for business and all sorts of commercial enterprises, they it's critical that whatever they rate their magnets at is correct. So that's the way I would suggest you go. It will cost you a bit more but um, it's certainly uh, worth uh, not having the grief that you would get from um, a, an inferior purchase. What you need to look for with these magnets is the uh, the rating on them. Uh, it's often expressed as N, N, N45 or N50 or 52, N54, something like that. The higher the rating, the more pulling power. Um, however, it doesn't increase um, exactly according to the numbers. The, the difference between a 45 and a 54 might only be 10% stronger but anyway you need the stronger rating uh, the magnet supplier I went to had a rating on this he, he didn't have an N rating what he had was um, a pulling uh, rating which was 160 grams um, so yeah I, I find them quite effective so shop around and see what you can get but certainly you want the smaller size I think the the difference in depth of these from one millimeter to one and a half millimeters, the difference in the thickness, uh, certainly makes a difference with their pulling ability as well. Right, the next thing you need is some galvanized wire mesh, and I get this from Bunnings here in Australia, but you could try your local hardware stores wherever you live in the world. This particular product is uh, two and a half meters long, and it's um, 50 centimeters high and the grid spacing is 25 millimeters square and uh, you might seem that uh, you might seem to think this, this looks familiar and it is familiar because I've used it to make uh, chain wire fencing uh, around my aerodrome so it's the same sort of stuff the next thing you need is um, some iron core chain and it's critical that this is iron core which means it's attracted to a magnet uh, the links in this are around about four millimeters long uh, you get about two and a half links into ten millimeters so yes the the smaller the better I suppose but um, somewhere around that size it makes makes the link about a foot long uh, which is getting close to the prototypical size I, I think uh, but anyway it's critical that these are attracted to a magnet. Now you would get this from um, uh, jewellery supply stores or craft stores or something like that and it might take a bit of shopping around. Um, I got mine from Spotlight here in Australia but that won't mean much to you guys overseas. Next up is some uh, copper wire. This stuff is about 0.8 of a millimetre. Um, I've purchased this to make copper links and um, same as the, to try and match the, the iron core chain so um, there will be a video inserted into this um, into this video to show you how to make these copper links but that's that's used for the uh, second link in the chain and we'll use a different uh, copper wire for the uh, the main connection to the uh, the mounting on the on the wagon I'm also using some um, uh, standard electrical wire this uh, electrical cable for 240 volts uh, and this is about 0.5 of a millimeter so it's a, it's a tad thinner than the the other one but it's also very easy to um, to use to wind in a jig and all that sort of thing and uh, easy to manipulate so 
bit of a concession there in the size. However, um, th this is an entirely practical. So if you can find wires that are around this sort of size and grade, that, that'll be fine. Now we also need some jigs um, to, um, to make these couplings consistently. And this one is a very simple one. It's just a bit of bit of plastic that I've got here, and I drilled a three millimeter hole in it and glued one of the magnets into it. And the reason I've done that is so that I can always get the same polarity on the wagons. I can have consistency because I don't want the the wagons to be attracted to each other or the magnets on them to be attracted to each other. I want them to repel. So it's critical to get them the right way around each time. And what I do is on the back here. Uh, this is all blackened up now, and you can't see it properly. There's the face of the magnet there. I put a magnet on there, and then I add the other pieces to it. So I know it's always the right way around. So that's a very simple little uh, tool, um, and you could you could rig that up in other ways, but um, that's why I have that. Uh, it has a couple of other uses as well, but um, yeah, that's that's very important to get the magnet polarity correct each time. The other thing I've made is a uh, wire bending jig and this is to do the uh, connection up the top of the coupling, the connection that goes onto the mounting. So what I've done here is I've got a one and a half millimetre pin, uh, that's actually out of a rivet and I've drilled a hole for that. You can see a couple of holes but um, the one I'm talking about, when I get my little pointer here, the one I'm talking about is We'll just turn that around. The one closest to the top here. Um, the distance between the center of that hole and the cut, the top of the cut in the aluminium angle there is three millimeters. And you can see that I've filed the sides of the top here to try and create a bit of a, a bit of a bend in the copper when I put it through there. Sorry if that's not focusing very well, but you get the point. Anyway, you'll see it in action later. So yeah, that's three millimeter flat bar with a hole drilled in it, three millimeters away from the cut in the top. You can see the little notch in the top there. The other jig I use is this one, which is for soldering. I've got um, a right angle bracket on here, another bracket at this end or part of a bracket. It doesn't make, matter how you make it up, but two right angle brackets will do uh, regardless of size. And I've got a spring here and I've got a bit of wire on this side with a hook on it. And the idea is that when the coupling is ready to be soldered you can you can fit it in there and it'll, it'll just put a bit of tension on the coupling to hold it in place while you do the soldering. Uh, you, couldn't, you couldn't really do it without some sort of way of holding it properly. I'm using standard old uh, super glue here, no name super glue, to uh, glue the fitting into the wagons. And um, obviously I've, I've got a range of pliers and uh, one of the important pieces I've got, one of the important pieces of uh, plier, I suppose, that I've got are these ones which are especially for jewellery making. Uh, they've just got rounded ends on them, they're on a, a taper, like, like a cone shape and uh, they're very handy for getting links off chain or for holding links and uh, for actually resizing links if you need to. So a pair of those is very handy, otherwise just standard small pliers to do the rest of the work. Now from the wire mesh we're going to start making our um, little mountings. So it's a matter of, um, I'm up the, the top of the, the end of the wire here, uh, which is not necessarily the best part, and uh, once we make these things we uh, we have to start straightening them out a bit as well but I just simply trim them off to the next layer as it were and uh, quite simply it see it doesn't take long and um, we make a whole batch of these in one go we can't use the end ones but uh, we finish up with a whole bunch of these so what we'll do then is separate these down the middle like that and then we've got, where are we, let's have a look, we've got, I cut it in about halfway 
So we've got the start there of a mount. Now we've got to trim that down, straighten it out a bit, uh, clean it up or, what, or whatever, but that's the start of one mount. And that, that's as simple as it is. And um, there's a whole lot of mounts in, in that uh, sheet of wire. Now just take your pliers and uh, bend it straight, as straight as you can get it. And uh, just fiddle around with it for a bit. Have a look at it from all the angles, etc. And you might say, well, how come you're using this stuff, Gormo? Well, the simple reason is, if I bring that closer to you, that joint there is welded. It's only a very fine weld, but it's welded. And that's why I've gone this way. So we just straighten that out. And uh, I'll keep working on that. And I think that's pretty good. So we're ready for the next stage now. I've got another piece of aluminium flat bar, which was uh, my original test run on, on making jigs and all that sort of thing. But it, it's got a, a number of holes through it, so I just pour, put the end of, um, let's call it the T-bar, uh, through there and, and hold the um, T-bar hard against the other side of the aluminium and get my snips and cut it off and then turn it over do the other side hold it tight against it and cut it off and there's my little t-bar ready to go now on the top of this thing there's a little piece that's that's proud it's sticking out what I'm going to do now is take that over to the vise and put it in the vise and I'll, I've got a file and I'll run across that and give us a nice flat edge on there. And what I'll do is file a, a, across the, uh, the T as well uh, to get a, a flatter surface which gives us a better surface area for the, uh, the um, magnet to mount onto. Now with the T bar I find it, it mounts best in the vise this way with the T going across the jaws like that. Uh, it's just much easier to put it in there and hold it and then we just take a, a flat file and uh, gently sort of file it flat. And we work on that until we can see a flat surface appearing on the on the T as well, which means the projecting leg of the T up to the T is uh, flush with it. That's looking pretty good now. Yep, that'll do. Now I would suggest when you're doing these processes, like this little T-bar here, that you concentrate on making quite a few of them in one go, say maybe, I don't know, 15, 20, whatever you want. And you know, you can see that I've got, I've got a bunch of them here that I've made previously. And um, you, you start to get into a bit of a rhythm when you're doing the one process, instead of jumping around from one process to the other. Um, I, think, I think you get more done this way if you sort of uh, work out your own sort of workflow uh, and you can improve on that and maybe work out some shortcuts and all that sort of thing and uh, also if you do one after another you actually get better at it as you go along instead of doing one then running away doing another process and then coming back you know sometime later to have a crack at another one so yeah I think repetition um, gets a better result in the end and uh, you can have a little store of these and you know one night when you're thinking about you know while I'm watching TV I might just um, straighten some of these out or whatever yeah the next thing we need to make is the uh, the middle link which is a copper link and um, I've got a, a box full of them here as you can see um, and I'll insert uh, part of a video I did before about making these things that I'll use these two bits of metal as um, formers to make the uh, the links and I squeeze them together in the vise, you'll see it in the video but um, these two pieces of metal are uh, three millimeters across, 
the width there and when you put the two of them together and squash them together in the vise like so uh, the thickness there is about 1.25 millimeters something like that right folks I've cut myself off about 350 mils worth of um, copper wire here and I'm going to sandwich that in the jaws of the vise along with my metal former so it's all held there and we'll lock that down now 300 mils is probably a bit too much wire actually but anyway all we do then is just start wrapping the wire around the former creating a coil in effect or a spring if you like and we just carry on doing that until we've uh, used up most of our wire. I've got a fair bit of tension on the wire. I'm pulling it tight around my former. And this is giving me the sort of shape that I want for my links, for my couplings. It's just a matter of winding it all the way around. I'm starting to get to the end. So at this stage, if you want to use all the wire, you probably really need a pair of pliers or something to hold the end of it but for this the purposes of this exercise uh, this will do so that's fine right folks now I take my uh, mini drill and I've got a thin cutting disc on the on the drill and what I'm going to do is cut along the top here through the copper wire Now we remove the whole lot from the vise here and gently ease it off and we finish up with our links. Okay so there we have it um, and then it's just a matter obviously of getting a pair of pliers and squeezing them together maybe even giving them a bit more shape but um, they'll, they'll go together quite nicely. Next step folks is to uh, take our um, winding jig or our bending jig and mount that securely into the vise. Now we get to the interesting bit folks. Now we get a bit of that uh, electrical wire and hold it between uh, two pairs of pliers uh, and then we bring it down to the slot in the top of the jig holding it very tightly between the two pairs of pliers then we drag it down vertically and flush against the side of the um, three millimeter flat bar and then pull it towards the end like so and then bring it up like that and then take it over all the way until it's horizontal with the or parallel to the top of the flat bar and then release the pliers squeeze it in hard against the flat bar and then remove the pin and you can take out your top piece. We then um, trim off the excess wire and we finish up with a little uh, link there. Now I normally try and clean the ends up there that I snipped off by coming at it at an angle and making sure that it's absolutely flush there. We don't want that little piece sticking out actually catching on anything and uh, yeah so it's just a, 
a bit of a clean up there and it comes up pretty good I'll show you a close up in a sec right. so that's what we're aiming for something that looks like that we can now add that to the T-bar I'm holding the uh, little link in the pair of pliers there and uh, just gently squeeze it in a bit so the um, T-bar won't fall off that's good enough we now want to add the uh, second link the copper link and um, because it was homemade it's got a bit of a twist in it so I'll just flatten that out first and then we'll hold that in the pliers pick up the T-bar and the other link and add it on and then we'll give it a squeeze to close it up and the pliers and make sure it's flat again so now we've got our second link on now we want one of our iron core links so I take my special pliers there and I insert them in the last link at the opposite end to where the join is so there's no there's no join on this end and just put it in and then give it a squeeze push it in a bit more give it a squeeze and it opens it opens the link so that you can take it off the chain with my iron core links I like to um, take them over to the uh, to the vise and hold them on there with a pair of pliers and, and put a flat um, surface on the end um, where the uh, the rounded end is so which is this end here um, yeah it just gives a bigger surface area for the link to attach to um, a magnet so yeah it's it doesn't take many passes with the file to actually get a flat surface on there because it's such a small area it just adds a bit more to the, uh, the actual um, strength of the thing I don't know whether that will focus on there but it won't no we then now pick up our T-bar with the two links again and add the copper core link sorry copper core where did I get that from the iron core link to the copper and same process just give it a squeeze like so right and there we have three links prior to soldering I take the uh, T-bar and I go to the uh, far end of it and use my uh, special little chain pliers if you like and just put a, a bend in the end of it so I've got a hook to uh, hook onto the uh, the jig I then hook the uh, last link onto the bit of wire that we've got here and while holding the shaft on the T-bar I bring the spring up and hook that on then generally have a look at it and make sure everything's sort of centered properly and lying as, as straight as you can get it now for the next stage the soldering I'm using silver solder uh, because it's much stronger than uh, standard solder uh, you need something with a, a, a good bit of strength to hold these links together to help me with the soldering process I put a tiny bit of flux just either side of the joint it just makes makes the solder flow better now I've got a 25 watt soldering iron folks and I just put a tiny piece of solder on on the um, on the iron tip and then just bring it over to one side here hold it there until it takes 
doesn't take much and then rotate the iron using the same spot where that most of the solder is and take it to the other side just hold it there for a second and then follow the same process for the bottom link this is the art of it folks is to get a small amount of solder on here and that should do the job and then we release the coupling from its mounting and we're done right folks what we're going to do now is um, glue the magnet to the, uh, the coupling so I'll just put a drop of super glue on a spare scrap spare piece of uh, scrap plastic there use a fine wire, copper wire to take the um, uh, super glue to the magnet so first of all I've got a small magnet here I've got to put that on onto the jig and it goes on this side to have the correct polarity so I'll just put that on there like that it finds its own way on and then we just use the fine wire just to put the minimal amount on the back of the magnet and uh, just a tad more and that's on there and now what we have to do is bring the coupling to the magnet and fit it on. So we have the jig vertical and also the coupling is vertical and just very gently bring it together and make sure that the coupling is centered on the magnet and we'll just have to leave that until it sets. It won't take too long but uh, in the meantime we can um, start looking at the wagon we want to put this on to and uh, how we're going to approach that. Right I think we'll have a go at this wagon. It's um, it's second hand. Uh, it's obviously been around for a while. Uh, I added the um, small tension locks on the bottom of it with some blocks under them so obviously somebody's removed the couplings before so it should be pretty easy to get those off I think a screwdriver will just take them not a screwdriver maybe a pair of pliers will take them off but um, I can save the, the tension locks and then just remove the blocks and I might check the um, gauging on the wheels while we're at it so yeah just to make sure everything's honky dory when you're working on wagons or locos folks it's always a good idea to um, use an old towel um, especially a white one because you can see where everything goes uh, not that we're saving anything here we're actually uh, removing everything so we don't have to worry about it but um, these little screws that are coming out gee that one's in pretty well uh, will come in handy for other projects down the down the track this one's a persistent little thing I must have done a good job on this anyway that's got them out so we've got uh, some couplings and some small screws there that might come in handy for something else now we need to look at getting these um, these blocks off these mounting blocks what we'll do first is uh, take the wheel sets out so we can check them on the gauge Make sure they're okay. Okay, now we're ready to um, have a go at these blocks. So I've just got a pair of pliers, and I think because these are glued on underneath, they should just, yeah, they'll come off. That's good. Okay, we'll try the other end. On on a, uh, a new wagon, or an unmolested wagon, let's say, um, this would be more difficult because there'd be um, coupling mountings to remove but there we have our subject ready to go well the next part of the process folks is I, I get a little um, uh, hand drill here uh, the drill bit matches the size of the, um, the wire and the coupling on the T-bar so 
you don't want it, you want you don't want too big a hole. You want as close a fit as you as you can get. So, whatever wire you can get hold of, especially overseas, you've got to find one of your fine drill bits to try and match that. And it's simply then a case of finding the dead center in the um, buffer beam here, and then drilling a hole through. So we will attempt do that so that you can see it and that went through fairly easily and it shows me that you know that the, the whole drill went through so it doesn't really matter how much wire I cut off to put in there so that'll be fine and um, so what we do is we try and push the um, the t-bar into that and um, We'll add some super glue to it as it goes in and let that set. Now I've got the uh, coupling and the T-bar here so with such a long length going in there I'm just going to trim this um, T-bar off wherever I like. I've got a little loop on the end if you remember I'm just going to trim that off and that'll, that'll be fine to go in. So we've got a T-bar now with the straight piece of wire to go into the wagon and we can do a trial fit if you like and just push it in if I use the right end would be handy and that goes in quite easily and you can see it's on there now so that needs to be glued in so we'll, we'll get onto that and um, add a bit of glue to it and push it in and let it set and I'll do the I'll do the same for the other end and uh, then we're in we're in uh, in business well now our wagon is ready to rock and roll you can see that the couplings have fitted at each end so we'll let that set the the glue set for a while before we test it out on a train but that's uh, that's how we get to this point here now once, once your coupling is made and before you fit it to the, um, the wagon um, you should test the clearance here between this top copper wire and the magnet. You can spread it out along the arms of the T-bar there to give you better clearance and you should test it in the, in the uh, full up position and the down so that it will, it will drop properly which it didn't do then. So yeah um, it's got to, it's got to have nice free movement. The other thing with the coupling is that it has to have um, movement in an arc across the wagon when it's fully extended out in this position. It needs to be able to move across at about well, I don't know what the the angle is, but it's got to have some lateral movement. Uh, so for it to um, allow the wagon to negotiate curves properly. So far I've only just been using a, uh, a permanent marker to um, colour the, the, the couplings as I'm making them. Uh, I'm trying to sort of think of a, an easy method. There are, there are um, gunmetal um, products and so on that you can buy to um, actually do this process but I've got a mixture of two metals here I've got I've got iron and copper and uh, I'm not sure how a dipping process would work on the two metals and you can get um, these colors to suit uh, brass and aluminium and all that sort of thing so uh, the jury's really sort of out on that one um, and uh, I, I sort of came up with the idea of also making a, um, a wash with uh, thinners and some um, some grey paint or something like that and trying to uh, dip the couplings into it just to see how that goes and uh, so we might, might go down that road yet but I mean painting etc um, I can leave that up to you guys you, you, somebody might have an idea I mean obviously um, an airbrush would uh, probably do the job you just don't want to get too much paint on there because it'll gum up the works if you like and um, stop the things from uh, moving freely so that's the, the one thing you've got to watch so 
whatever coating goes on to the uh, the metal has to be very thin and uh, so th there's got to be a way there's always a way folks and uh, we can work that out at some stage so here we are finished folks and uh, ready to be uh, inserted into a train we'll just have a look at the other end there's the other end ready to go all right we'll try um, connection to a wagon the auto sort of uh, couple if you can call it that yep that's working now we'll turn it around and try the other end and we'll try it yep got him okay and obviously it will work the other way as well on the other wagon so if we put that one up yeah got it i'm quite happy with that folks that'll do me the nice thing about it folks is how it looks when it's in in a train um, the spacing's about the same as tension the tension lock couplings but um I think the appearance is uh, considerably better. You've got the uh, three links there hanging down and connected as well. So, yeah, quite happy with how it's going so far. Now, to make a connection for a loco, folks, I use these big suckers of uh, staples right there. They're very serious sort of staples that go into a big serious. Uh, sucker of a, a staple gun you know this is for doing upholstery and stuff like that if you want uh, these particular staples I use because um, they're, they've got a good width here and they're flat and um, which makes it easier to connect them to um, a, uh, a magnet so they're actually if I measure them they're um, just over 10 mils wide uh, which doesn't really matter much but uh, and they're uh, 10 mils high so if we peel one off which is quite simple really what we're really interested in is the thickness of the staple which comes in at one mil so it's one mil wide now out of that staple I'm only interested in this one piece here I'll cut the other pieces off and what I'm left with is around about six mils worth of flat bar there which and six mils is the width of the uh, the T on the T bars so it's ideal so I just get some uh, normal old uh, snips and just put them into the end of the staple there chop that end off I've got bits of bits of wire and stuff pinging all around my shed here folks and we'll just cut off cut off the other leg and what we're left with is this little um, flat piece that we want to put onto a magnet so I'll just I'll just get a couple of magnets and we'll show you the process for that right the first thing we do is add a magnet to the back of the uh, the jig then we add our little bar now the first thing we've got to do is get some um, super glue onto that magnet and uh, working quickly then we can get the bar onto the magnet once the super glue is on there and we'll just quickly add that on and centralize it very quickly right now we can add a bit more super glue to the bar and we'll grab another magnet and 
we can add that as well make sure and we'll just wait for that to set now given sufficient time for that to, to uh, all set or for the super glue to go off um, we just take one of our stand, standard couplings that we've made and sort of push it onto the pliers to open out the jaws a bit in the top there so we can uh, fairly easily get it on we hope to the um, t-bar that we've just made right and there we have whoops where are we there we have another coupling that can go on to the front of a loco now here we, here we have a little saddle tank that's got um, magnet glued into the uh, well near the buffer beam there at the moment there's also one on on the rear end uh, this will go either way so we just literally bring the uh, magnets together and and there we have it so I can just take that and pull it off simple as that the other thing I should cover folks is the uh, obviously this uncoupling tool now this is just a piece of uh, dowel that's uh, 200 millimeters long and it's uh, what is it here it's fifth uh, sorry five mils uh, thick so it's just a bit of dowel uh, you could use a lot of things to do this but what you want is something that uh, is not magnetic so stay away from uh, wire that will be attracted to the magnets that's why I've used wood and, and plastic here the plastic has come out of um, ice cream containers so you know if you if you don't mind a bit of ice cream from now and then you know keep the lids and all that sort of thing you can make all sorts of handy things out of them I've actually even made um, guitar plectrums out of them but what I've done uh, is I've cut a slot in each end so I can slide a bit of plastic in and what I've done on on this end is I've cut this V shaped piece of plastic obviously it's a there's a skinny bit that goes up into the slot here and um, I've drilled a hole through here and just put a copper pin through so that that can actually be pushed out and that can be removed but this is uh, approximately uh, what are we looking at there about 11 to 12 mils wide there and we're we're looking at here we're looking at about six mils and the reason this is short the plastic piece is short in length here is so that when I push down on one of the uh, the links that's especially attached to say a loco that might have a tension lock underneath it it won't go down uh, too far um, on the link and and hit the tension lock in other words it gives me enough room to move the link away from the magnet uh, just as it hits the tension lock if I had this longer um, I wouldn't be able to do it because the tension lock would be in the way also it's double sided on one side I've cut cut it off here square so that it's got a ridge on this side which actually catches on the uh, the link as it goes down whereas the other side that's against the magnet this side it's it's smooth and tapers down towards the plastic so it can slide past the magnet on the other end I've just made a skinny um, pointy uh, triangular shaped piece of plastic that's uh, let's see how wide is that that's about that's about uh, 38 mils there but that's you know that's up to you that's purely for um, getting under the uh, or under the end of the wagon or the loco and being able to lift the uh, the link and I've made it pointy at the end so that you could actually put that inside a link if you needed to for any reason I haven't sort of come up with a reason to do that yet but it's it's to move the links and also to move um, the droppers on tension locks and that sort of thing so this is a necessary tool to the whole operation you need a uh, a good shunter's pole that's what it is in effect is the shunter's pole so yeah the important um, piece is is this here and if I mean you can you can have a crack at it and sort of improve it yourself and if you're using sort of plastic containers or ice cream ice cream containers you've got plenty of 
um, material there to use and practice on and, and develop a design for yourself. You might even want to thin down the, the outside edges here. Uh, this is my first and only um, attempt at it. Um, so there you are. Now this system is, is really meant for, I suppose, tank engines that don't swing, have a big swing at the front end or back end when they're going through a curve. However, it can be used on, on bigger logos like this and especially a tender engine is not really a problem. This 9F has a uh, magnetic system fitted to the buffer beam. I've got a tension lock coupling here without the hook and on here I have a magnet fixed to the buffer beam and uh, I just noticed I've got a buffer missing there that's annoying anyway uh, so yes so um, it's quite simple to hook up a chain to that magnet um, and or a, a tension lock coupling to the tension lock coupling fitting there on the front of the loco I've actually adapted a bit of wire and, and bent it because the um, pony truck is quite long sorry on this loco it was easy to get at it and I've glued a right angular piece of wire to the pony truck here and the magnet moves with the pony truck so this was a particularly easy one to do but there are other locos that I've got that will be an absolute nightmare so with that in mind I mean on, on the tender it's fine you don't really get the movement it's just like using a tank loco but on any locos that would cause you great problems I think it's it's not worth going to the trouble of doing it whereas you can use a converter wagon this is a converter wagon we have a tension lock at one end and we have one of Gormo's three link couplings at the other end problem solved it doesn't doesn't really matter what you run um, you can turn it you can have it connected especially to this loco with the chain and you can connect tension lock couplings up behind it or you can turn it around that way connect it by the tension lock coupling and have um, rolling stock with, with the chain system on it on the back there an advantage of the system is that it looks uh, far more prototypical even though technically the chain system I've devised is not prototypical it's it's similar but uh, actually quite different to a normal three link coupling system because we don't have the prototypical hooks and all that sort of thing we've done away with those in preference of magnets an advantage to this system over some other three link systems is that if we have um, the coupling fitted to the loco as I've showed with the magnets and if we have a wagon that we push into an inaccessible spot say in the, the good shed there so it's inside the good shed uh, what we can do is um, manipulate the coupling and I'll get my tool to do that and we'll show you that this is not prototypical either but we can take the coupling and turn it through uh, what would that be 90 degrees so it um, it sticks out it will swing from side to side now and then Okay, folks, it's not prototypical, but I don't care.
Another thing that's important to show is these uh, the method for these bogey wagons. So I'll take a bogey off and we can show you. Of course each one will be different depending on uh, how it's set up. But you can see what I've done here is um, I've taken a piece of wire, I've drilled a hole through the, um, the central part of the bogey there and uh, I've glued the wire onto uh, or above the axles there on that piece of plastic and I've, I've turned it up at a right angle here. Now on this end here I would have, um, what I've done is um, taken that to the vise and I've actually flattened the wire, let's see if we can see it there I've flattened the wire so that um, it's got a good surface area there for the magnet to attach to and the glue so different bogies, different approaches but that's essentially what it is and the chain is pulling and it's got even pressure right across this bogey to pull now this one is a, a different approach again and I've got the other end off so I'll show you that yeah, so what I've done here is I've had to uh, look at how I can mount this wire. It's a different setup altogether. So I've glued it underneath the center part of the bogey there. And then we've got a right angle bend of wire that comes up so that it can right angle bend again to go over the top of the axle and clear it. And the whole aim with these things is to get this up at a height that's in the center of the buffer beam. So we've had to do a couple of bends on this one and it's the same approach with flattening the wire uh, to, to get a good uh, surface area so you can attach the, uh, the glue and the magnets there. Yeah, so each one will present its own new, unique problem but they all work in the same way. Well folks, uh, that's, that's about all I can tell you I think. Um, there's um, It requires a bit of work to put this system together however the uh, the cost of it is is very good I mean the most expensive part of the whole thing is the magnets and that's because I've bought them locally from a reputable uh, supplier so it works out to 30 cents per magnet so if, if you look at it realistically in terms of cost um, we've got two magnets per wagon uh, sometimes you could possibly have four magnets on a, on a loco, possibly more. But anyway, if we work on a wagon, you've got two magnets per wagon. That's 60 cents. Now, the little T-bars that I'm making, uh, that roll of wire, I think, was about seven or eight bucks. And if you calculate how many usable T-bars you can get out of that, that's about 1,800. So we, we won't even bother trying to calculate the price on one T-bar or even two T-bars. Uh, the wire, I'm using electrical wire uh, and that can be sourced from bits of wire that you've got laying around or just go and buy some electrical wire, household electrical wire. Um, and the chain is um, only a modest amount for about a metre. I think it's, I don't know, three or four bucks or something like that. Can't remember now. So when you look at how many links are in the, uh, a metre of chain, you know, all that sort of thing. It would have to be less than a dollar per wagon, but if we're pessimistic and we say one dollar per wagon, and if you compare that to uh, commercially available couplings, um, you know, it's, it's only a fraction of the price, especially if you've got, say, a hundred wagons or so to do. Um, it's a hundred bucks or less uh, compared to maybe three or four hundred or more. Um, I think KD's... Um, are probably more expensive than tension locks. I haven't really done the research on that, but uh, yeah, tension locks are, are getting more and more expensive now. I think the last time I looked at my local model shop, um, it was over 20 bucks for a packet of 10. And so, um, you know, that's $2 a couplings, that's $4 a wagon. So there's 400 bucks if you've got 100 wagons. So anyway, um, that, that's one of the advantages of it. It's cheap, but it takes a bit of work. To do it and uh, the best way I think is to sort of um, make yourself a store of all the individual parts sort of get onto a bit of a, a working bee and create yourself maybe 20 40 60 uh, of the T bars and that can be done quite easily uh, the chain links as you can see from um, the video on how to create your own chain links 
um, you can knock up a lot of them very quickly. Uh, in, in a couple of sessions you could have hundreds of them. Uh, and then of course the commercial um, uh, iron core chain, well, you know, all you have to do is separate the links. That's no big deal. So none of it's, none of it's hard. I suppose the trickiest part and the most crucial part is the soldering. I do, I do have another way of um, creating the upper link and the middle link by bending the wire but I don't think it's entirely practical. It doesn't look quite as good. Um, it's just as much work as, as soldering links together. So I, I haven't really included that in this um, session. Uh, it's um, not really tried and tested. It's, it's not 100%. Uh, and the only other thing I would uh, suggest to you is you look into ways of coloring the links. I'm still doing that. Uh, I'm considering trying to make up a wash of, say, grey paint with, uh, you know, maybe one third paint, two thirds thinners, something like that, and, and just dip them in it. Whether that'll work, I don't know. I've got to try that. At the moment, I'm just using the uh, permanent marker to colour them up so they don't look so coppery and silvery. So uh, uh, that's it, folks. Um, so uh, any questions, just fire away, and you know where I am. <laughs> I'll talk to you later. Have fun with couplings. <laughs> Cheers, Gourmet.